love talking about my Hollywood life. I went to this event in Hollywood and um, I always tell people you never know who's watching you. Whether you do good or bad, you never know who's watching you. And there was a lady who was watching me and she was like, Tensi, I hope you don't mind me sharing this with you, but I was watching you and I liked your mannerisms. I liked how you interacted with people. Have you ever considered red carpet hosting? I said, well, no, ma'am, I haven't, but I have my bachelor's in communication. I'm open to it. So she gave me her card. I followed up. Always make sure you follow up. That's where a lot of people go wrong. And I followed up with her. She got me in hosting classes and I've been on more than 300 red carpets in Hollywood. I have interviewed everybody from Magic Johnson to um, Denzel Washington. I've met Oprah Winfrey, Smokey Robinson. I'm good friends with Miss Tina Knowles, mother to Beyonce and Solange. <laughs>
at that time, my brother had returned to North Carolina. So I was going by myself. I tell people I had no family, no friends, but my faith. And I knew I could make it happen. And I attended a University of Southern California, graduated in 2014 from the Rossier School of Education and began working for the USC Black Alumni Association as manager, assistant director and associate director respectively. I love working with students. And so I was able to help make their career dreams come true. I helped them with internship opportunities, seniors and graduate students who were graduating. I helped them find employment and really used my network to try to bring in more funding to the Black Alumni Association for scholarships for our black students. After that, I was a consultant for an executive uh, recruitment firm and then stayed there for almost two years and decided to go on my own. And now I am CEO of my own company, TJT Consulting, where I am principal consultant and I hire top talent for a living, as well as do professional development coaching, leadership training, and celebrity networking. So I always want to give homage to my parents. Uh, my father is an ancestor now. He is in heaven, passed away in 2021. But I thank him and mom for the foundation that they laid for me and for always telling me to dream big because I believe I have. Wow. I'm just sitting there saying, wow, 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 wow. It is such a rich, diverse, um, and I believe that everything also started from your um your parents do you know what I mean your parents and what your parents showed you when you were growing up and I can also be a testament of that for my mother and my father one's from my mom's from Jamaica my dad is from Barbados and they both showed me the importance of hard work yes. of determination of not giving up you know anything is possible but you just got to put the work in and you have to plan so those types of characteristics have really embedded in me and rooted me and you know into the person that I am now and plus I love that you highlighted the experience that you had when you went to LA when you was 14 did you say yes 14 gosh I tell you what again I so relate to that when I was nine years old I went to Jamaica first time going abroad anywhere and let me tell you something life-changing yes. absolutely life-changing everybody says do you know what I mean if we we need to know where we come from to know where we're going isn't it so having that first trip to Jamaica changed everything for me yeah, you're so right, Sophia, because one of the words that my brother taught me at a young age was exposure. The, the younger that you are exposed to something, or if you see an individual who looks like you, or as you said, Jamaica at nine years old, going there changed your life. It exposed you to a different world, to a different country, to what else is out there. And I love being exposed to different situations, to different countries, to different people. And in essence, I give back and expose people to different things. When I worked at USC's Black Alumni Association, because I'm very connected in Hollywood, a lot of my students were interested in the entertainment industry. And I would ask them to volunteer at different events. And some of my students got to meet, you know, Beyonce's mom and John Singleton and all these individuals. And now they're director of Lifetime movies. They're working for the Oprah Winfrey Network. They're on Good Morning America just because I exposed them to an internship or volunteer opportunity in Hollywood. So you're exactly right. Just exposing people to different things can make a world of difference. And you know what, as well, you said um, through your mentoring, people are now in, you know, roles that they may not have thought or they would have thought, but just having that mentoring helped them to guide and support them in the right direction. So I think a lot of this is also about mindset, having that mindset of self-belief, because when my mind, for me, when my mind is made up about something, that's it. <laughs> I'm like, nah, this is it. And I'm going to achieve it. And I'll, I'll always achieve it. You see what I mean? So I think that is just so beautiful in terms of having that mentorship and that guidance and support. Did you have a mentor throughout your Yes, I've had several mentors, family members, professors. Uh, when I was a freshman at NC State, I will want to give a shout out to Dr. Monica Leach. She not only kept me in college, but kept me encouraged. And so uh, my dad had brain cancer and underwent almost a 10 hour surgery. And my mother had fallen and broken her ankle and the medical bills were just piling up. And even though I had gotten scholarship money, I, I didn't have enough. 
to allow me to stay. And so I went to Dr. Leach and told her, and she was like, baby, you are not going anywhere. I am going to help you find money. And she found me so much money that all of my expenses were covered. And so she became my mentor as a professor, guiding me through life and just always encouraging me. Anytime I had a question or an issue, I would reach out to her. I've had different supervisors in my career who served as mentors. And, you know, I've even kind of had peers who have been mentors, who have undergone some of the similar situations that I have to share their advice, to give me a hug, to set me down and have a conversation when I need to. And so mentorship is so important. And so because I had so many people who poured into me, who wanted me to be the best version of Tensi, that's why I mentor today. I have so many different mentors and I can't mentor everybody, but if somebody sends me an email or a text or a LinkedIn message, I will try to share some advice, some sagacity with them to let them know how to deal with a certain situation. So I am so grateful for mentors and they've opened up doors for me. They have said my name in rooms that I didn't even know they were speaking my name into. And then just magic happened after they did that. So I am so grateful for those who paved the way, saw something in me, even if I didn't see it in myself, because it truly made a difference in who I am today. That's awesome. I just love your energy. It's so inspiring. It's so engaging. It's so motivating. It feels for me, the energy that I'm getting through, because we're doing this on Zoom, <laughs> when everybody that we're doing this on Zoom, right, is that I feel as if I just need to get up and get things done. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's your energy. It's so bright. It's illumination. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, sunshine, you. sunshine rays. That's how I feel. Thank you, know, you. You just said something you, you you just said, yeah, you know, Beyonce's mum and John Singleton, may he rest in internal peace. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, let's talk about that now. Like, what now? <laughs> type of thing. So we want to talk about Hollywood life. So how did you um, gain um, opportunities, you know, hosting on the red carpet at all these major wonderful events that I see on TV? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, look at that. Oh, my gosh, they look so good. Oh, look at that hair. Yeah, I want to follow that hairstyle next time. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> how did your opportunities come about? Yes, thank you. I love talking about my Hollywood life because when I left North Carolina, uh, my family threw me a going away party. And in my farewell speech, I said, I am going to take it advantage of any and every opportunity, every good opportunity, let me clarify that, that comes away in California. And so I went to this event in Hollywood and um, I always tell people, you never know who's watching you, whether you do good or bad, you never know who's watching you. And there was a lady who was watching me and she was like, Tensi, I hope you don't mind me sharing this with you, but I was watching you and I liked your mannerisms. I liked how you interacted with people. Have you ever considered red carpet hosting? I said, well, no, ma'am, I haven't, but I have my bachelor's in communication. I'm open to it. So she gave me her card. I followed up. Always make sure you follow up. That's where a lot of people go wrong. And I followed up with her. She got me in hosting classes and I've been on more than 300 red carpets in Hollywood, I have interviewed everybody from Magic Johnson to um, Denzel Washington. I've met Oprah Winfrey, Smokey Robinson, I'm good friends with Miss Tina Knowles, mother to Beyonce and Solange. And so that's how that opportunity came along. In addition to, I'm just, I'm very extroverted. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm very extroverted. And I just had to be in the know. And people would send me opportunities saying, Tensi, they're looking for volunteers at this Hollywood event. They need somebody to stuff gift bags. I'm like, I'm here for it. So there I was in my black uh, evening gown, stuffing, um, putting items in the gift bags and putting them on all the chairs. I arrived early, went above and beyond with my duties, stayed late and sent a thank you email to the coordinators. And they saw that in me. And so I went from volunteering to stuffing gift bags to escorting talent on the red carpet to actually presenting um, celebrities with their awards on stage. So I presented Will Smith with an award, uh, Quincy Jones, Angela Bassett, Vanessa Bell Calloway, Ryan Coogler, you name it. I have a whole album in my cell phone where I've met and taken pictures with more than 600 celebrities. I've been in rooms with millionaires and billionaires and it's just a blessing. But I say that because I came in humbly. 
I didn't go in thinking, oh, I'm too good to be a gift bag stuffer or things of that nature. I wanted to learn. And people saw that, that I had a humble spirit and they gave me more responsibility. And now they trust me of different things. I've had casting directors, Robbie Reed, she's cast for uh, Denzel Washington, Vanessa Williams, and I helped her for different events in Hollywood. And she's like, Tensi, I trust you. Can you help me with this? Using volunteers or finding volunteers to help her. And so I'm just incredibly grateful. Uh, one of the coolest things that I've gotten to do uh, was get my hair done by Beyonce's mom. And she was just as fabulous as ever. And she did that as a thank you. Uh, when I was at USC, I started a partnership with her and her nonprofit organization and our black students tutored the middle school students in her class. And so she was so grateful to me. She's like, Tinsy, what can I do to thank you? Not only did she purchase copies of my book, but I said, Miss Tina, I've always wanted highlights in my hair. She was like, done. And so I got my hair done by Beyonce's mom and she was just such a great experience. So I really just am a go-getter and I come in very humble and I don't try to act like I know something that I don't. And I just like to leave people better than how I found them. So I have a smile, good energy. And I feel like those factors have contributed to me being successful in Los Angeles because a lot of people move to LA to become an actress or a model. I didn't move here for that. I moved here to go to graduate school. And so when people see all my posts, they're like, Tensi, how are you getting to hobnob with so many celebrities? It's, it's God and it's my personality. So that's how I got into Hollywood. Wow. Again, that's going to be a key word that is going to be shared throughout this interview as well. And also, I'm thinking about when you say the Southern hospitality, for those who are here in the UK listening to that, what does that mean? Because I tell you something, me and a group of friends, when we were 40, we traveled to New Orleans for the Essence Festival. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely lovely. Would New Orleans be the Southern part of the US? It is. You're right. Okay. Explain what is a Southern hospitality? Yes. Yeah, so the Southern hospitality are, is those people who are from the South, North Carolina, Florida, South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, Texas. And it's just a Southern way of doing things. We're, we're very friendly. We're very kind people. And we never meet a stranger. So we can be pa up walking along and see someone on the sidewalk. We're like, hello, good morning. How are you? And it's just something that's taught. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm from North Carolina, and that's part of the Bible Belt state. And so we're really grounded in faith and religion and trying to show God's love any and everywhere we go. And so we just speak to everybody. We're warm. We're welcoming. We try to help people. There's no ulterior motive. And so that was kind of a culture shock when I moved to Los Angeles because I would speak to people and they would look at me like, why are you speaking to me? Uh, what do you want from me? Being in LA, when I was on the red carpet, a lot of celebrities would say, you're not from here, are you? And I would say, no. I was like, I'm from North Carolina. They're like, I knew it. You're so sweet and kind. And so it's a compliment, but also kind of not a compliment because whatever other part of the world or part of the country that's going on, why aren't people just being nice to one another to simply be nice? I'm not trying to get anything from you. I'm not trying to get access to your network. I just want to make sure that you are okay and try to spread love and light. And that's what we do in the South. So that's what the ho Southern hospitality means. Even when we try to um, say something not nice about somebody. We don't say it in a mean way. We just say, bless your heart. And everybody from the South knows that that's really a negative connotation. We say, oh, bless your heart. And we're not even saying anything bad, but we know that means, yeah, you need to get it together. <laughs> bless your heart. I'm going to remember that one. You know, I can maybe testify to that in terms of going to New Orleans. So New Orleans is in North Carolina. No, it's in Louis that's, Louisiana. It's in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Oh my gosh. I would say it was how we were treated. And I think as well, it's something about being British and going to the States anyway, is as people want to know, you know, you're black and you're from the UK. How is that type of thing? Where are your parents from? And all of those wonderful questions people ask, you know, so I had a fabulous time um, in New Orleans. It was absolutely amazing. But I've been reading about I done a little bit of digging and diving, you know, and I was doing <laughs> some reading consultant, motivational speaker and best selling author. Hey, how great <laughs> is that? OK, so I want us to 
maybe dive in about um, the relationship between the premise of your book, okay, and resilience. Um, so could you share what happened and what your book is about? Yes. So my book is turned eight years old this January. It's entitled Bullied from Terror to Triumph, My Survival Story. And it recounts the 13 years of bullying that I faced uh, beginning in kindergarten all the way until 12th grade. I was bullied for my size. I'm very petite. I have always been petite. I was bullied for uh, my appearance. I had big eyes and I used to be very self-conscious about the, the size of my eyes because students said I look like a frog. They said that um, they call me this name, Geico Direct, like the Gecko, uh, the Geico Direct commercial. Uh, they made fun of me for being a straight A student. I was always that overachiever. So they said that I was trying to outdo them when I was simply doing my best because that was just born in me and I wanted to excel. I was bullied because I didn't wear name brand clothes or shoes. Uh, my parents were educators, so they made a decent living, but we weren't rich and they really had their priorities straight. So we lived in a beautiful house in North Carolina that sits on almost 70 acres of land and that's what they wanted to focus on, the house and the land, not necessarily buying the Nikes and, and the Adidas and all this stuff. And they had two other children. So three children total we had to take care of. And so students bullied me for not wearing name brand clothes or shoes. And so it was really bad. And then I was physically bullied. I was pushed in lockers. I had my arm almost broken in a gym locker room. And it was just awful. I endured a lot. And I contemplated suicide when I was 16 because it was just so, so bad. But thankfully, I did not give in to those negative thoughts that were in my mind at the time. And I also thought about my parents. Uh, they, they grew up in the segregated South. So it's such a dichotomy because the South, we're very friendly, but the South also has a negative history with uh, discrimination and Jim Crow. And so my dad had to walk five miles to school every day because he couldn't ride the bus because he was black. Uh, my mother had to enter the back of stores because she couldn't go in the front door because she was black. And almost every other day they were called the N-word, but yet they persevered and went on. And so when I thought about their struggles, I said, if mom and dad could overcome what they went through, then yes, what I'm going through is bad, but I too can overcome this because I have the Taylor and Richardson blood uh, flowing through my veins. And so at that moment, I just really became even more extroverted. And I said, if they, if people are mad at me because I won 10 or five awards this academic year, they're going to be really upset next year when I win 10 awards. So I turned that negativity into positivity because I wanted more for myself. And I wanted to, in essence, prove people wrong as well. And so I endured a lot, but I went on to accomplish great things. And so my book talks about that. It's It'll take you on an emo emotional roller coaster. You have the highs and the lows, but in the end, I came out triumphant. I mean, you've heard some of the things that I've gotten to do throughout my career thus far, and I'm just so incredibly grateful. So I decided to write this book in 2016 because a lot of people are bullied, especially cyber bullied. And I wanna tell my story to encourage them that there will be better days ahead. And the psychologist who wrote the forward to my book, Dr. Gloria Morrow, she says that hurt people hurt people. And a lot of the people who bullied me were very hurt. They came from single parent backgrounds. Uh, they didn't have the resources that we did. Every summer, my family and I took a, a vacation and they stayed home. And I felt bad for them and I tried to befriend them, but they didn't always accept me, but that was okay. And so I tell young people, Find your circle, find your uh, friends who believe in you and never listen to the negativity of others and never let another human being have so much power over you that you would wanna take your life because you matter, you definitely matter. Hmm. Just even thinking about how you contemplated suicide at 16, I can't even imagine what you were thinking in terms of to the result of taking your own life you know that must have been such a horrific horrific time for you yeah. even to think about that but then what changed 
in terms of you saying to yourself, do you know what? No, I can't because you said that you've got your family's blood running through your veins. So I cannot give up. I have to be determined and I have to turn this round into a positive. What was that? You know, I, I will mention this throughout this interview. I'm a, I'm a woman of faith and I thank God for how uh, my mom and dad instilled religion and faith in me. I grew up, I'm a Christian, but I grew up Baptist and Episcopalian. And in the moment when I was about to take my life and when people read my book, they will, they will read how I almost did it. It was a, it was something in me at that moment that said, no, Tensi, you have so much to live for. You have such, you have just so much to live for. You have so much um, that you're going to help people in this world. And so don't give in. And it was the Holy Spirit, I think, talking to me. And I remember pulling over uh, I was driving. I remember pulling over and just boohooing. I uh, started to cry very, very heavily because I'm like, oh my goodness, well, what was I about to do? And to think that I would have, you know, had caused my parents so much pain. Um, and then the few friends that I had, they would have been devastated. And so I just really think it was God who spoke to me in that moment and allowed me to see who I was and allow me to just flip the perspective. Because one of the things I have seen in my life is I am a light. I am very extroverted. I'm happy. Even on my bad days, I'm happy. And I have had people just treat me so negatively because I'm happy. I've had former coworkers ask, why are you always so happy? Even when people compliment me, they would say, don't feel special, Tensi. She compliments everybody. Just trying to take the light from me. And so I have just realized that myself and other people who are light, when somebody's miserable, when somebody's unhappy with who they are at their core, they will try to extinguish that light. And I will never allow anybody to allow me to extinguish my light. And so to those who are listening to this, if you are a light and bring good joy and positivity to this world, we need you. And don't ever let anybody take that away from you. And to those who are struggling internally and have darkness inside of you, I pray that you will find that light because life is so much better when you find the joy within yourself. Life is already challenging. It's difficult working with people. It's difficult interacting with different individuals. And with all the war, war, uh, wars that are going on in this world, we need as much positive energy as we can. So I pray for those who are struggling with their darkness, who are struggling with their unhappiness. And if you come to the light, I promise you, your life will be so much better. So I choose to be a light and I will never again, as I mentioned earlier, let anybody have that much power over me to where I feel like I don't belong here on this earth. You definitely get an amen from that. And I feel that you preached a sermon right there. <laughs> you know? Amen. Yeah, you definitely get amen from me right there. And also I was reading up um, where one, um, an ex-bully contacted you on Facebook, isn't it? And how did that um, pan out? What happened? Yes. So an ex-bully did contact me on Facebook and this individual was always commenting on my pictures and she decided to send me a message on Facebook and said, hey, Tensi, it's good to see you doing your thing. And I said, thank you. And I said, do you remember how you treated me in school? Because this bully made fun of me every day. I just really made my life miserable. I was afraid of her. This was when I was in elementary school and she didn't remember how she treated me. And when I reminded her, she was like, you still tripping off of that? Like, girl, that was years ago. Get over it. No apology, nothing to that magnitude. And so that just let me know right there that I needed to keep her at a distance because people can change. And, and if she had said, oh my goodness, Tensi, I didn't know, I'm so sorry, I treated you that way, but she kind of dismissed it. And I haven't said anything else to her since. And so to those people who have bullied others, you just never know how your words and actions can affect them. When I was on a book, book tour, I talked to a gentleman, he came up to me and he said, Tensi, I bullied people in school. And he said, I never really thought I bullied people, but hearing your story and how people treated you, I was a bully. And he said, I am going to go on Facebook and find those people that I bullied and apologize to them because what I did was wrong. And so that's how it should be. None of us are perfect. I'm definitely not perfect by any means, but when I've made a mistake or done somebody wrong, I do try to apologize. But yeah, that bully just acted like, I. why are you still talking about this? And it was so shocking to me, but 
again went right along with who her character was it's very rude that she done that firstly but I'm also thinking about if he wasn't here the impact that would not have occurred you know for that ex-bully to get onto Facebook and reach out to others and apologize for their behavior you know for the hundreds and thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people who have purchased your book and are transformed and are encouraged and are inspired by the words that is written to motivate them to, towards positive action and to show empathy towards others. So I always believe and to feel that we all have a purpose, but it's us to figure out what that purpose is. But I believe that God shows us little signs, you know, along the way, and it's up to us for us to see and to hear what that is. Yes, absolutely. And you're so right, Sophia, because it's unfortunate what I went through, but it made me stronger. And now I, I am very vocal. If somebody mistreats me at a restaurant or if I'm mistreated by a colleague, I will write a letter. I will leave. You will not disrespect me because I finally found my voice. I will never physically lay hands on people, but I will find my voice and fight that way. And so I feel like what I endured, I was so shy and I just let people bully me and run over me that now I don't allow that to happen anymore. And I'm also encouraging others to do the same. I do a lot of talks to parents, to students. And one of my biggest regrets is, and my parents didn't fully know everything. Even when they read my book, they were shocked about everything I endured. But I wish I had been involved in martial arts. I heard a story several weeks ago where this girl was being bullied and um, her parents enrolled her in martial arts and the bully tried something and boy, that bully has not messed with her ever since. She did some type of move on her and hurt that girl and the bully has not bothered her since, nor has anybody else. And so I'm not advocating for violence, but when people push you to an extent and really threaten your life, you have the right to fight back. And so I tell parents, enroll your children in jujitsu or martial arts because there are ways that you can harm somebody to let them know I'm not to be messed with. I so agree with you in terms of protecting oneself. Um, it's definitely important. We're definitely not advocating violence, but the importance of self-preservation as well as having a, being self-aware and also knowing your boundaries. And I think that is key. Okay, yes. knowing your boundaries, when you were sharing your story just a minute ago, and I was thinking about um, being a people pleaser, and also because I have been a people pleaser, have been, you hear that, have been a yes. people pleaser, and that comes from a sense of not having high self-worth, not having high self-esteem of myself, you know, and thinking that I always have to um, do extra for individuals and for people just for them to like me. But I need to love and like myself first and foremost. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. whatever is within comes without. And also when you love yourself, you don't put up with nonsense from others. Do you know what I mean? You know what your boundaries are. Exactly. You have said a sermon just with that um, comment that you gave, but you're absolutely right. I used to be a people pleaser and one of my uh, things for 2024 is my peace, protecting my peace. If you are infringing on my peace, if you overcross my boundary, you got to go. Life is too short. I don't have time to deal with the foolishness. And so you can't please everybody. And at the end of the day, when we do so much for certain people, they still don't always fully appreciate what it is that we do. So what is the purpose of trying to help everybody or please everybody when they're not even grateful for the things that you've done? So now I really uh, surround myself with people who appreciate what I bring to the table, how I can help them. And it's reciprocated. I realized I took a step back sometimes, like why am I always going above and beyond for this person? And then I ask for one um, request or something to help me with, and it's always a no, or let me get back to you. But I never did that to them. So when I saw that a lot of these relationships were one-sided, I took a step back. You're so very right. Um, in my nature, I like to help. Um, I like to serve and I like to help people. And um, I had my 50th birthday in January 
and um, everybody came and when I knew who was coming I knew who was going to be there I had my nice little excel spreadsheet going on and I know <laughs> who was attending and everything like that but when I walked through the hall I was absolutely shocked I was amazed I did not believe that everybody would turn up and I walked in and I just burst out in tears because I was overwhelmed by you know what the love the mm -hmm. love that I received and I was reminded that day I was reminded that day that what I give I'm getting back and it is an yes. opportunity for others to really tell me and show me how they feel about me. And I can't even now, I mean, this is like six months after the fact, look at the videos and the pictures because it is so, it's so overwhelming for me that people love me so deeply. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So if everybody operates in love, and I've always said this, if everybody operates in love, we would never lack. Yes. We would always, we would always have, do you know what I mean? We would always have, if everybody operated in a sense of, let me help, let me give this, let me, we would, whatever we give, we always get back. Do you yes. know what I mean? But I had in my mindset, I'm just doing stuff. I'm just being Sophia. I'm just doing things. Mm -hmm. But on that day, it was so overwhelming. The overwhelming of just love itself in its purest sense and form was is so so beautiful so so I didn't I didn't even know how to handle it I was just in tears for the majority <laughs> of the event I was in tears because it was so overwhelming and I can see why people would come and first of all you don't look 50 okay when you said 50 I'm like 50 where <laughs> And I'm not surprised that people would come because as I said, when we first connected, I felt like I had known you my whole life. You have this beautiful spirit about you and you're so beautiful out outwardly as well as inwardly. And so even just listening to you share that story, I could feel the emotions overcoming you because you were just like, wow. And I think back to that sometimes like myself, I have been in situations, I've been invited to events or People will send me a nice thank you note or a nice thank you gift. And I just will burst out crying like, Tinsa, you don't know how much you helped me. You don't know how much your prayers meant. You just don't know. And I just, like you said, I want to be, I want to spread love. I want to be a light to different people. And it always comes back. It always comes back. I remember when I was in college, I was a resident advisor to my uh, um uh, students and when I was a junior in college and they had thrown me um, a beautiful uh, party because they say you're the best RA we've ever had and I had spent almost like $200 on them getting them gifts to um, thank them for who they were to encourage them as final exams were coming to an end out of my own pocket I didn't mind and then my uncle just sends me a letter and says, I go by my middle name, Janine. He was like, Janine, I'm so proud of you. Keep doing the great work. Here's $200. <laughs> I'm like, I just spent $200 giving these young ladies something. And then I was blessed in return by my uncle um, just encouraging me while I was in college. So you just, you can't beat God's giving. And when you're a good person, it always comes back. It always comes back, isn't it? And not in the form that we think it's going to come back, but it always comes back at the point of need. Do you know what I mean? And you can't rush it. You can't force it to come. You know what I mean? You can't slow it down, but it always comes at the point of need. And I want us to talk about positive thinking and gratitude. For you, how has your experience, you know, helped you to marry the two of having a positive attitude and gratitude? Yes, great question. If you ask my mom, my siblings, they will tell you that I've always been a happy child. I was a happy kid. I remember for my fifth Christmas, I wanted this pink Barbie car, one of those motorized cars. And the Christmas before my dad, I had asked dad if I could have it. But dad didn't have the money at the time. And I go and I open this gift, this last gift that's about the size of my hand. And again, the innocence of a child. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, maybe my pink Barbie car is in here. And my dad said he was so touched that he was like, I don't care what I have to do. Janine is going to get her pink Barbie car next Christmas. He sacrificed. He shopped at the Goodwill. 
And uh, Christmas 20, December 25th, 1992, I screamed when I looked under the tree and there was my pink Barbie car. And I rode and I rode that car and dad and I had such a great time. And I've just always been grateful for everything. If somebody gave me $5, if somebody gave me a piece of candy, if somebody gave me $500 for a scholarship that I was trying to seek, I was grateful for that. So I want to paint that context that I've always been a happy child. But then as I got older and saw the sacrifices that my parents made, that many individuals contributed to my life, I continue to be even more grateful. And so gratitude is so important. I have an attitude of gratitude and I'm grateful for everybody um, from the CEOs to the custodial staff, I'll tell you another story. I'm a storyteller. I get it from my mother, who was a librarian. But when I was a senior at NC State University, I always made it a point to get to know everybody. The janitors, the uh, cafeteria staff, everybody. You were somebody to me. And I remember I formed a great rapport with Mr. J. And we would always uh, check in. I was like, Mr. J, how are you doing? How's your family? How's your children? He's like, oh, Tensi, things are good. And so my last day, I said, Mr. J, you're not going to see me anymore. I'm graduating on Saturday. He said, well, when you finish your lunch, meet me outside. So I thought he was going to just, you know, give me a hug and wish me well. And he, I meet him outside and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out $50. I always get emotional kind of telling the story. And he says, I want to thank you because you treated me like a human being. He said, students would come in here, some faculty and staff would come in here, and they would look down on me because I served. But he said, you never did. And he said, God is going to take you places. You have a spirit about you. And I was shocked. And I gave him a big hug and I thanked him. But I was shocked because I was being rewarded for being kind, for treating somebody like a human being when that's what we all should be doing. And so I just always try to get to know everybody. When I worked at USC, I became friends with one of the custodial workers. And I saw her one morning in the elevator. And I was like, Miss Paula, how are you doing? And she's like, Tensi, I'm tired. I'm about to leave this job to go to another job because I'm trying to support my daughter who wants to go to law school. I said, well, God bless you. I hope that your daughter is appreciative of what you are doing. I thank you for always keeping my office clean, for emptying my trash cans. I don't know what I would do without you. And she was from Guatemala. And when she went back home to Guatemala for Christmas, she came back and she was like, Tensi, I have something for you. Gave me this beautiful dress from Guatemala. She's like, I'll never forget what you said to me about my daughter. So I share those stories to say that I'm grateful for any and everybody whether you are the trash person, whether you are a mechanic, or whether you are a president of a Fortune 500 company, you matter. And I feel like because I'm grateful for the small things, it makes it easy for me to truly be grateful for the big things. Because how can we ask God for something bigger if we're already showing him that we don't appreciate what he's already given us? Every morning I wake up, I say my prayers, thank you, God, for allowing me to see a brand new day. Thank you for a roof over my head, for food on my table. Thank you for allowing my mother to still be here. And then I'll just write down different things that happen throughout the day that I'm grateful for. And so I feel like because I'm always grateful, I'm always happy, which always contributed to me having like a good day. And you know how there are some people that every time you see them, there's always something wrong with them. I just have to push back and say, you know what? You might be going through some challenges, but you are alive today. And there is somebody who did not wake up this morning. So be grateful, be grateful for that. And I just remember seeing my mom and my grandmother growing up being grateful and thanking God for the small and the big blessings. And so my, my family environment, as well as the people I've gotten to know in my journey have contributed to me having more gratitude. But to those who are listening, be grateful for everything. Every day is not perfect. You're not always going to get what you want, but any day above the ground is a great day. That's so true. Every day above the ground because we're alive, isn't it? So we must give thanks in that. But how do we become so grateful when we're going through the twists and the turns of life and life is so hard for some it's so where people are struggling do you know what I mean how do we become or how do we live a life of gratitude what what useful tips can you share great question uh, the, the main tip I would share is switch your perspective 
So we're all going through something, things that people know about, things that people don't know about. And you just have to find the good, even in the bad. I remember even after losing my dad, oh my gosh, that was just such a very rough time for me. I cried. I would hear certain songs on the radio that reminded me of him. But then I thought about how he raised me, how he took time with me, how he molded me and, and shaped me. And he would say, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And one of the most beautiful things that came from my dad's passing was his students who reached out to me. And my Facebook inbox was flooded with letters from students. And one student said, Tensi, I had your dad for freshman English. And he told me that I was a great writer and he encouraged me to get a journal and just to write every day because you become better at something by doing it. And she said, now I am the editor of a magazine with more than 50,000 subscribers. Even though dad was no longer with me, I was grateful that dad had that impact on that student. Another lady reached out to me. She said, Tensi, when I was a senior in high school, I became pregnant. And she said, other teachers, even my family turned against me. You have made a big mistake. Why would you do this to yourself? You're never going to achieve anything. And she said, your dad sat me down and said, listen, life happens. You are where you are, but you find your village and you find your support system and everything will be okay. I encourage people, even in the worst of times, to find that gratitude, try to find what lesson am I trying to learn from this? What is God showing me with this challenge that is going on? And, and I think that will change your mindset. It will change your perspective because, and then too, again, if you're a person of the faith, go to God in prayer, call on him, sing to him. And even when I was being bullied, a lot of times I would sing, I would play the piano. If you read uh, autobiographies of people you will see how many of them were bullied. Beyonce was bullied. I remember talking to Miss Tina and she said that she would come pick Beyonce up from school and Beyonce would be on the swing set by herself because nobody wanted to play with her. Kids made fun of her ears. If you notice, Beyonce never really wears her hair up um, because she has bigger ears. Students called her name such as Dumbo, but look who she is today. Prince was bullied. That's what encouraged him to get into music. That's why he played so many different instruments. Music was his outlet. So you read stories of people you admire, you start to realize, yes, I'm going through something bad. And this person has gone through something similar and look who they became. Or if you read stories of people who are going through something bad, it could be worse. It could be worse. So I'm not trying, it's not trying to be the oppression Olympics of who's gotten it worse, but just always put things into perspective. What we think might be bad for us, another person will be willing to trade places with us because of those things. And like I said, if you go through your day and just find three things that you're grateful for, one, definitely waking up. Even if you don't like your job, you have a job and you have a chance to try to find a new job if you don't like it. And so I just always try to look at the positive. I don't like negative people. And I'm that person that if you give me your problem, I'm going to give you a solution. And then there are those people who will find a problem with the solution that I've given them. So I just stay away because I'm like, you don't, you don't want to better yourself. You just want to complain. And if you complain all the time, you're not going to see the gratefulness in the life that you're building. Again, you get an amen from that. That's another sermon that you gave right there. Tenzi. <laughs> So very true with regards to switching your perspective. Um, if you focus on the negative, that's all you'll see. If you focus on the positive and what is right and what is just and what is pleasing, then that is all that you will see. And I think that's so important. I know some people may have, you know, a journey of getting to that point where their mind switches from negative to positive, but it is possible, you know. And I always say that if you constantly overthink and dwell on the negative, it leads to misery. Yes. Easily leads to misery. You become low, you become depressed, you don't want to meet and integrate with anybody because you're just focusing on the negative. And mm. you know what? 
there's a um, a really popular TV program over here called EastEnders, okay? And it's based around a square called Albert Square. They say, if you're constantly thinking, overthinking about situations, you're going to be creating your own EastEnders in your mind. You know, it shows the lives of real individuals type of thing. So always say that if you're overthinking and constantly thinking about the negative, you're creating your own, you know, soap opera, soap drama in your mind, which doesn't even exist exactly about, isn't it how about we focus on um thinking about pondering on the positives because that is what we want to bring to light to bring to our environment isn't it so there you oh, go you're so right Sophia and that made me think of something I tell people if you're going through a traumatic situation or if you're unhappy volunteer your time go to a homeless shelter go to a women's shelter volunteer at whatever organization that you feel compelled to do so and whatever you think that you had that is post that is now paused because your focus is on helping this organization that you're volunteering I love volunteering not only to connect with people but it just also shows me how blessed I am when I give food to the homeless community, I used to uh, work with a friend and we would pack lunch back, uh, lunch boxes and go to Skid Row, which is a very predominantly homeless community here in Los Angeles. Uh, women, we would get hygiene kits and, and submit those and hand those out to different people. Whatever bad day I was having, I felt good because thank God I'm not homeless, but thank God I'm able to use my resources to help those who are homeless, to give them a meal, to allow ladies to be able to you know, deal with the things that we as women deal with by the time of the month. You know, you don't think about stuff like that with the homeless community. And then you just take the focus off of you. Um, I feel like our society today is so me, 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 so narcissistic. Look at me. How is this going to benefit me? How much money can I make? Okay, that's all right. But what are you doing to help others? It's great if you make seven figures, but what are you doing to give to others? How are you contributing that money to better society? And that's what I like to do. I like to definitely look nice and shop and do things like that. But I also want to give back and help others so that they too can have opportunities that I've been afforded. You're so right, because people always remember how you made them feel in terms of positive thinking and having a gratitude mindset. They definitely are combined, isn't it? They influence yes. one another. So they as do. We, isn't it? So as we wrap up, what would you like our audience to remember about your particular survival story? Yes, I would love for the audience to remember I didn't give up. And not only did I not give up, but I didn't become bitter. I once did an interview with this lady and she said, Tensi, you didn't become bitter, you got better. And I know we're all facing a struggle in life, but just because you are going through a hard time does not mean you now have to put that on somebody else smile, give a hug, give a compliment. I don't know how many times I have networked with people just by giving them a compliment. Oh my gosh, you're so beautiful. Oh, I like that suit on you. You look so dapper. Oh, what's your name? And then we're exchanging information and now I'm at an event with them just because I gave a compliment. There's no reason to walk around miserable and whatever you are doing in your life, if you're not happy with it, change it. I went to the UPS store the other day to take some things back. And I was like, good morning. Lady did not speak. And I was giving her items to scan. I had three items. And she said, how many items do you have? I'm like, are you okay? D do you need a hug? Whatever you're going through, I hope you, I hope you get through it. Because she was so negative to my positive energy that it affected me. At some point, first she didn't speak. Then she was upset because of the items that I was returning back. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is your job. If you're not happy with your job, then please try to find something that will make you happy. I love following Tabitha Brown on Instagram. She is this lady from North Carolina. And she will always say, honey, you go about your day and you have a good one. But even if you can't, don't you dare go messing up nobody else's. So even if you yourself are having a bad day, please don't go spreading your negativity to anybody else. And so I have that attitude of gratitude, smile, be grateful and believe, believe. I, as you mentioned, I'm a motivational speaker. I always like to end my messages with believe, 
Even if others don't believe in you, as long as you believe in you, that's what matters. I hear so many stories from people today who are NFL players or actors or um, billionaires who their friends doubted them, even their parents doubted them, their siblings talked negatively, but they believed in themselves and look who they became. And so I just encourage you to find your way. Uh, Google is our friend. Anything is on Google. You can Google it these days. There should be no excuse as to why you can achieve. One of my favorite quotes said, a pessimist finds problems and opportunities while an optimist finds opportunities and problems. So go forth and be great and share the light in this world. Oh, you are such an amazing, beautiful, beautiful spirited woman. You are definitely light. You are definitely light. And I just love that. So how can people keep in contact with you and buy your book as well? Um, yes. yes. Thank you. So my book, Bullied from Terror to Triumph, my survival story is available on Amazon. But please follow me on social media. My Instagram is my name, Tensi Taylor, T-E-N-S-I-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. And then please connect with me on LinkedIn. Tensi J. Taylor is my information. And if you want to add me on Facebook, Tensi Taylor, I try to be a streamline the process. Everything is Tensi Taylor across my social media platforms. But again, Sophia, I want to thank you. You are so beautiful. You put me in the mind of Jennifer Hudson. Has anybody ever told you? Everybody you says that. Everybody says that. And it's so interesting. I think, when was it? Um, maybe about, say, 10 years ago or something. My dad said to me, you know what? Because my dad lives in Florida. He lives in Orlando, Florida. And he said to me, do you know what? So you look like Jennifer Hudson. And I said, oh, do you think so? But um, my hair is short now. Before I had long locks to my bottom. It was long locks to my bottom. So I just cut them in January. So I got, got this short thing going on here, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I said, when I see Jennifer Hudson at times, I see it, sometimes I don't. But yeah, she's a beautiful woman anyway. So I take that. <laughs> can't sing like her though. <laughs> Cannot sing, can't sing to save my life. But yeah, I, I'll take that. Thank you. Yes, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for coming on to the Long Story Short podcast, Tenzi. Thank you for having me.